Okay, let's pray. Lord God, come open our hearts for your word. May you bless us to leave your house better than we came. Bless and inspire us to proclaim your name and word to those who do not believe in you. Make us shining examples in the society. We ask this in the name of the Son of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading today comes from the book of John 16, 16 to 22. Jesus said, a little while you will not see me, and another little while you are all, you all will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, what does this mean that he is saying to us? A little while and you all will no longer see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I am going to the creator, and because I am going to the creator, they said, what does he mean by this, a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, are you all discussing amongst yourselves what I meant when I said a little while and you will no longer see me? And again, a little while and you will see me? Very truly, I tell you all that you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You all will have pain but your pain will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has pain because her time has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the tribulations because of the joy of having, of having brought a human being into the world. So you all have pain now, but I will see you all again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I wanted to make sure everybody knew that we have been blessed this year with not one, not two, but five new babies, five, five different families. That's unusual in the life of Hunting Ridge Presbyterian Church recently, correct? Five different families in our midst have been changed forever by the additions of Claywell, Gabriel, Andrew, Sobe, and Carissa. For a church of 105 members, that is quite an increase in one year. Each one of their birth stories are different. Each family faced their own unique stresses and complications. The baby was overdue. The mom had to be on rest from work for weeks during her pregnancy. Excessive ongoing pain after delivery and even additional surgeries. If you ask each one of those moms, she would tell you that pain is involved in this experience, but that once a healthy baby is here, the pain recedes into the background as joy and celebration move front and center. Birthing partners who accompany a woman in labor could attest to that same truth. The pain quickly gets forgotten and the focus shifts from her to her baby. 
And for the first time parents, the focus quickly becomes figuring out what to do to care for him or her. This morning, we overheard a conversation as Malachi read the text from the Gospel of John. We were overhearing a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. He was trying to address their confusion over his comment that soon he will be gone and then they will see him again. Here he is, a single male, using an example of a woman in childbirth to explain what he meant. Their pain will turn to joy. Seems he could have found another image that would get across the same message. Like a story of pain and anxiety over something of value being lost. Perhaps you remember that in the Gospel of Luke. It was a tragedy on the eyes of the character in the story. And then there was great joy at finding that lost thing. Perhaps you remember the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Moving from pain and anxiety to joy. We've read that before, I'm sure. Or he could have maybe used an agricultural image of the dormant time of a fig tree, perhaps. Fig trees are mentioned multiple times in scripture. A time when it's empty and not producing. And then there's a season when it all of a sudden becomes abundant and full of joy and full of fruit as it ripens and is ready to eat. But no, Jesus doesn't use agricultural. Jesus doesn't use something lost and then celebrating it found. He uses the image of birth pangs. The birth pangs analogy is not unfamiliar to Jewish ears, to those who were listening to him at that time. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament uses that imagery several times. He compares the pangs of woman in labor to the pending fall of Babylon saying that that powerful city will be emptied of its power and control over Judah, and it will be painful for them. Later, he describes the people of Israel as living without a healthy relationship with God. A lot of the prophets are pointing to that, that they don't have their relationship right. And he says that no matter how hard they're trying to connect with God, to get it on their own. They're laboring like a woman giving birth, but they're giving birth to the wind, to nothing. Going through birth pains without producing anything of value. And then further on, Isaiah again toward the end describes God telling the people that she has been quiet for only so long about her displeasure at the antics of Israel. Now, it's been quiet all this time, she's going to cry out like a woman in labor. And here is one place in scripture where we find God's action described in feminine terms. Everyone knows that that kind of cry is loud and anguished. God's response to the antics, the troubles, the lack of connection from Israel is anguished cry. <clears throat> and in the last chapter of Isaiah, we find that there's an extended description of God giving birth to a new Jerusalem after their time of exile. So when they've come back to their home place, after they'd been in a time of great pain and loss, this new community, this restored city is described as the one that's born even before the birth pangs start. It sort of sounds to me like God is giving birth to them by cesarean section. Isaiah, in his writings, in his speaking to the people, describes Babylon in labor, describes the people of Judah in labor, and even God in labor. There seems to be no question that for Isaiah and 
for Jesus. Labor is a necessary, painful process which is intended to produce joy on the other side. That's the way that they look at it. We today must acknowledge that there are some mothers and fathers who do not experience joy when that child is born. Perhaps the child is stillborn and the sadness continues. Perhaps a child is born with a condition that will limit his development and his experience of life in some way and the sadness continues. But we are made, we are created, we are formed and shaped to be people who will have an experience of pain followed with joy at the arrival of a new life. Now we don't really know how much a single man knows about childbirth, but Jesus knows enough, apparently. He wants his disciples to be prepared for the time when they are going to be in pain. They're going to be in sadness and grief. A time when he's going to be taken from them and they will be at a loss. Without saying it, he's preparing them for his death, which is coming soon. But then... There will come a time, also soon, he says, when their joy will return and the pain will be forgotten. Without naming it, he is preparing them for his resurrection. John sets this conversation within what is described in the Gospel of John as the farewell discourse. It's several chapters of Jesus teaching his last teaching before he's arrested. The very next chapter begins his prayer, his extended prayer for the disciples and for the world as a whole, and then he's arrested and sent to trial. So it's his last words. Instead of soon, Gaffney, Dr. Gaffney, in the translation that we read this morning, uses a little while They mean the same thing, soon, a little while, an undetermined, fairly short time period. The problem is that different people have different assessments of a short time period. What is short for you might not be short for someone else. Hours, maybe, or days, maybe, or weeks, or months. Jesus says a little while and you'll no longer see me. For the disciples, that is confusing. Well, what does he mean? How long is a little while? How much time do we have before we're separated? And what's that separation going to be like? They are not clear. Does he mean he has plans for a trip somewhere without them? Will he tell them all just to go back home to their houses kind of like the way that crowd of runners was told as who followed Forrest Gump when he ran and ran and ran and then all of a sudden just stopped, turned around, and said, I'm going home. So everybody else went home as well. Does he mean that something violent is about to happen and he will be killed? Is that what he means? I'm not sure the disciples could really wrap their heads around that because they may have not thought that was going to be possible. Or maybe they, that's exactly why they asked for confirmation and clarification because they were already worried about the swirling animosity against Jesus in the community. That is what Jesus meant but they didn't get it. It was not clear for them. They were focused on the time frame. Well, just how long is a little while? Soon. It's open-ended. Jesus is not going to be pinned down and say tomorrow or the next day or next month. He's not going to say a specific time, but soon. And I am sure that that does not bring a sense of calm to those disciples. 
And then in another little while, he says, they will be able to see him. Now that's really confusing. First he's gone, and then he's going to be back, and we'll see him again. Because if they're separated, and that separation brings sadness and grief, then what's going to happen to reunite them? How is their joy going to come back? If it's a death, then what could possibly happen so they would see him again? There's no concept in their mind of a resurrection. It would never have entered their thought process. And when is he talking about? In a little while, soon, sometime undetermined. Now, depending on our age, we're more or less able to handle the answer soon, right? When we're very young and mom or dad tells us that we're going to be going swimming soon or we're going to be going to gymnastics class soon, we're extremely fidgety because we're waiting for whenever that soon is going to come. Depending on the circumstance, being told soon could even be a little bit painful, anxiety producing, bringing some kind of sadness and grumpiness. Have you ever seen that in a child when they weren't ready to wait for something? I have to use the bathroom. Can we stop? Soon. Is tomorrow my birthday? No, but soon. When we were young, we don't really have the concept of time, and soon is very unclear and confusing. Now, even as adults, when we are told soon, it can be difficult. We want to get into that hospital room to see the loved one of ours who is nearing the end of life, and we're told soon. We're anxious to hear the results about a medical test or a job interview or a college application. We'll get back to you very soon. The disciples are told to get ready. Life is on the verge, soon, of changing for them. Their traveling adventures with this Rabbi Jesus are coming to a close. I think they got that much. And it's going to bring a sadness. Jesus knows they will be extremely sad and pained because this separation is due to death. My friends, if you sense change coming soon in your life, if you can kind of smell it just like you smell the crispness of the, uh, that signals the coming of fall, if you know something is coming, you might have the opportunity to prepare yourself for that change. You're going to sell your house. You know it's coming soon. Your child is going to go away to college. You know it's coming soon. That actually has more of a specific date. So you can prepare yourself whether it's going to be a change that brings joy or pain or sadness. But sometimes there's no warning. An earthquake startles you awake at night. You suddenly get let go from your job. The congregation that's been sharing our building for 10 years tells you on Tuesday that they're moving out on the following Sunday. Sometimes this change can be a shock. As I reflect on our relationship with the Baltimore Falam Baptist Church, who are the ones who told me on Tuesday that they were leaving on Sunday, I can see Hunting Ridge Presbyterian Church as having been in labor, bringing into the world a fledgling congregation of Burmese immigrants. It was God's work through us. We kind of served as the womb, if you will, for them, surrounding them with a stable place to worship and to learn, to sing and to share in fellowship. We've welcomed them, we worked alongside them, we bore the extra wear and tear on the building that comes from a congregation packed with very young families, and we witnessed their growth in numbers and in their ability to navigate life here 
and in their English ability. I trust that we've left them with a positive image of Presbyterians who seek to live out our faith in God of grace. The Baltimore Falam Baptist Church incubated or nested here at Hunting Ridge for 10 years so they'd be ready to go out on their own. Probably didn't seem like soon to them with a 10-year period. We had no idea that they would leave so suddenly, so soon, but they didn't want to tell us until all their arrangements were final and firm. I'm sure that all their process of finding the right pastor and saving up enough money didn't happen soon enough for them, but they were very patient, and we were blessed to share our space with them for that time. And I hope, as Malachi said this past week, as we prayed for them, that we will continue to keep them on our prayer lists as they begin their new location. So I guess soon is in the eyes of the beholder, right? When you're having a great time somewhere and your friend says to you, we have to leave now, you say, so soon? When you've been hanging around with Jesus, traveling the countryside, watching him at work, listening to him teach, and he says, a little while and you won't see me, you say, so soon? John portrays Jesus as being patient with them, repeating, explaining, offering a real-life analogy of what they will experience. They will experience pain suffering, anxiety, and loss, but then followed by joy and celebration. And I can imagine that when all of that happened to them, that they would have looked back at Jesus' teaching and they would have said, aha, he really did mean soon. He warned us. Now we understand. Time for us to get to work sharing the good news of Christ. Amen.